भावी जी चीफ गेस्ट आ गए हमारे चिरा चिरागरा जी चिराग जी नमस्ते एंड वेलकम हेलो एवरीवन नमस्ते जी सर इज आई थिंक आरबीओ के है ना आई वी आरबीओ कैन यू हियर मी प्रॉपरली यस यस कि मैं काफी माइनॉरिटी में आ जाता हूँ लंदन बिल्डिंग का शायद मैं ही हूँ अरे तो माइनॉरिटी वाले तो फायदे में रहते हैं ना हाँ <laughs> देश के हिसाब से तो आजकल तो ऐसे चल रहा है अभी मैं तीन चार लोगों को ज्वाइन करवाता हूँ जल्दी लंदन लंदन बिल्डिंग वालों को ज्वाइन करवाता हूँ एंड प्लांटन मशीन डी दोनों Hi, all. Good evening. How are you? Fine, fine. Amaji, welcome. Thank you, sir. So, uh, uh, Amaji, you are in uh, Mumbai or Pune? Ah, uh, from Mumbai. Mumbai. Where Where are you located? Ah, uh, Shivaji Park. Very well. You are in the key area. Ah, uh, yeah, kind of convenient. Very good. गुड इवनिंग डॉक्टर चिरागरा गुड इवनिंग गुड गुड सर यस यस ऑल ओवर जी सिक्स थर्टी आप स्टार्ट कीजिए फिर हाँ श्योर श्योर ओके वेलकम टू ऑल एंड टुडे इट इज अवर प्राउड प्रिविलेज दैट टुडे वी हैव अ वेरी क्रिटिकल लेक्चर एज सच बिकॉज द सब्जेक्ट इज वेरी क्रिटिकल एंड इट्स माय प्रिविलेज टू वेलकम एवरीबडी फॉर दिस लेक्चर Uh, on my personal behalf and on behalf of uh, association of valuation professionals uh, we have huge activities so i happen to be very lucky to have uh, this uh, leading this group as a president and we are uh, holding webinars every week almost every week thanks to sandeep and uh, this association of professional valuers is uh, still in the first year and we already have a, a huge number of webinars held we also have some international members and some tie ups also internationally but my colleagues will uh, explain that in detail our newsletters are also circulated all over to all the valuers around 5000 in india right from march we started newsletters and i think almost seven newsletters are through 
we also had very uh, ambitious uh, webinars on very critical topics also like uh, paytm ipo valuation last week and a few months back we also had zomato and uh, again value at risk is a very critical topic so having said that uh, you know i always believe that sharing of knowledge helps all the people including the members and the uh, participants so it's my appeal to all the participants that who sir are not the members of avp please become the members now uh, the the membership fee for avp is only 5000 and that's only one time lifetime membership fee there is no annual fee however anybody wants cp hours then there are annual fees which is 1500 plus 18% gst we have a tie up with iiv rvf and uh, we have been very fortunate that we are getting the support of everybody and uh, people like uh, chirag sir or amaya sir they have kindly agreed to our request by sparing their valuable time and uh, therefore i have a reason to believe that we are a very lucky association where uh, prominent personalities are uh, giving the lectures and even are coming as chief guest if you see the qualifications of both of them and the background of both of them you will be simply amazed our chief guest is a doctor and ceo and our uh, ameya bhankar ji is engineer plus mba plus cfa plus ck uh, i i one thing for sure i know that uh, engineering is a very strong degree uh, in fact uh, when i passed my 11 standard i was told to go to commerce and not to science because uh, uh, there was a feeling in my house that engineering is too tough and i may not be able to digest it that itself created a very high regard for me about engineering uh, similarly cfa you know i i never tried cfa do i happen to be ca cma and cs because i knew that uh, cfa is another you know big challenge so therefore uh, uh, having a learning from abhankar sir uh, will be a easier job we thought um, i request everybody to become a member and uh, also would like them to go through our journals uh, the journal link is also available on linkedin as well as social media Uh, we have international members from melbourne london dubai and we are in the process of tie ups with canadian valuation organization and we also are in discussion with the singapore valuers association and us valuers association uh, we already have a tie up with sme chamber of commerce uh, who are uh, you know sort of uh, having a membership of 15 lakhs okay apart from that uh, the the objective of our association is to spread maximum uh, the valuation knowledge and that to at no cost uh, so that gives me a pride that we are uh, a group of mentors most of the people who are senior they are good mentors also so including me all of us are taking care of the younger generation of course we have many young members also apart from that uh, i am happy to tell you that our members are right from guwahati to somnath and kashmir to kanyakumari and uh, therefore uh, i have a proud privilege of having a all india integration in our association with these few words i hand over to my colleagues um, today i will have uh, some other occupation so i will have to be excused but uh, i welcome all and i welcome the chief guest and the chief speaker and give it to start uh, over to you sandeep ji and my colleagues uh, go ahead please thank you so now our member ca sangeeta parmar ji will give brief introduction of our learned chief guest chiragra chakravarti ji for the day uh, thank you sandeep sir <coughs> am i audible yeah 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 prathme na arjita vidya द्वितीय न अर्जिता धनम तृतीय न अर्जितम पुण्य चतुर्थम की करिष्यसि इट्स इंग्लिश ट्रांसलेशन इज व्हाट कैन डू यू व्हाट कैन यू डू इन द फोर्थ पार्ट ऑफ योर लाइफ इफ यू हैवंट अर्न नॉलेज इन फर्स्ट 
money in second and merit in fourth let's gain some knowledge good evening everyone i am ca sangeeta parmar practicing chartered accountant from gurgaon haryana i am incredibly honored here to stand here and <clears throat> get opportunity to address the developer of a financial market of a country yes i am here to give brief introduction of dr chiragra chakrabarti i sincerely thankful to ram mohan bhave sir and sandeep agrawal sir for giving me such opportunity dr chiragra chakrabarti sir currently is owner of patek consulting consulting associate partner of truth north partner llp uk advisor to governor bank of mauritius mauritius sir has recently selected as an expert of financial market and reserve market reserve management by international monetary fund previously sir was cfo of financial consulting business of nri fintech providing consultancy in the area of capital market commodity market financial market and uh, financial market intermediary risk management treasury management data analytics and valuation sir in his earlier organization build up relationship with south africa ghana nigeria kenya botswana and nambia's financial and commodity market and their regulators for the development of pan african multi asset exchange sir has assisted government and multilateral agencies in exploring various financial and commodity market development and capacity building initiative both in india and abroad sir has assisted various corporate and banks to set up their risk and treasury management departments sir has participated as member and subject matter uh, and subject matter expert to various technical committee of india of uh, government of india and financial sector regulators agencies sir has helped the exchange for demutualization demutualization process previously sir worked as a cbo at borse africa limited sir has been director Deloitte, Associate Director at PwC, VP of MCX Limited, and Head of FT FTK MC. Sir has worked for SP the Krizail India. Sir has been visiting faculty at Premier Premium Edu Premier Edu Academic Institutions in India like IIM, XLRI. Wellinger and Tis etc. Sir has done PS PhD in financial economic and authored three books on financial market and also authored various pub pub publication in renowned journal and periodical. The list is so long that I can go, uh, I can continuously go for one more hour, but I'm sure after knowing. Dr. Chiragri Chakrabarti, you all might be being impatient for listening him. Sir, you are incredible, and your leadership and accomplishment are true, true inspiration for all of us. Now I request our honourable chief guest, Dr. Chiragri Chakrabarti, to address all of all and enlighten us with the true word, word of wisdom. thank you and over to you dr chagra chagraparthi sir thank you ms sangeeta parma thank you so much for that introduction uh good evening everyone i'm really honored and happy to be part of this webinar i sincerely thank uh, mr sanjeev sawal uh, who was our ex or was my ex colleague in deloitte when i was to work with deloitte for inviting me to this and also thankful to mr harvey and mr agarwal and the association of valuation professionals i'm really happy to be part of it although i'm sitting 
far away from my favorite city, Mumbai. I'm based in Mauritius now, but my heart still is in Mumbai. So very happy to see people from that part of the world. I think uh, you guys are doing excellent job that meeting this every Friday and doing, and discussing this technical topic. Uh, I'm, I'm, today's topic is pretty technical and um, I will do a great job, I know that. Uh, but I think it's very in, important that professional people like you should meet every week and discuss technical topic because this will not only enhance the knowledge as Mr. Bhave said, but it also will give you new thoughts and ideas. Uh, and that will help to enhance your professional career, which you may not get it in any particular book or journal. So I think this is a great thing which you're doing. Uh, so I'm really happy to be part of it again. Now, just to come to this topic, uh, which we are we're going to do, discuss it today. Uh, before I go to the topic, I would like to start this with, you know, uh, uh, two uh, sort of a, one question and one story uh, before I go to the main theme of my brief session. Uh, although 10 minutes I have, I'll try to we finish it within the 10 minutes time. My first question comes to all of you is that, and which I was always think about it when I used to do a bit of financial instrument valuations when I was in PwC and Deloitte, is, is valuation a science or an art? What is it? It is a valuation what you do. Is it a science or an art? And as I was, as I'm going and going and enhancing in my professional career, I'm slowly trying to understand, or I'm trying to get to understand is that this is a combination of the two. Why it's a combination? Because it's an art uh, from the perspective that when you select the input variables for any particular valuations, that's an art, I suppose, because the way you select the input variable, the time period, which valuation, which mod, which variables you to select for it. So it's, that's an art and which you get along with the experience. And why it's a science? Because it, it deals with uh, a scientific model building so whether you talk about Excel model or you talk about high, you know, Python based model or anything, uh, whichever you want to talk about the quantitative model. So it's purely a combination of an art and a science. And I think that's why people from various uh, field can come to this set of valuations uh, profession. Uh, and, and they can also, they can do good in this part of the game. Uh, you know, those guys can do good who can combine this uh, two very nicely, the art and the science part of it. Why? Because valuations has a lot to do with the mindset or the need of a person buying it from you. So definitely you have to combine them in a, in a very nice way. So that's the first, you know, comment which I wanted to make from my own experience, which I have seen uh, in my last 26 year of professional career. I'm not a valuer, but obviously, Nobody can work in financial market or in as a regulator or anywhere without having valuations knowledge or without having input from the valuer. Now, another example I would like to give it here, uh, you know, about uh, when I talked about science, I said it's a model uh, and we require a lot of model building, which we always do in valuation. And it reminds me of a story uh, which I used to narrate in my, you know, when I used to go for some of the visiting faculties that. Uh, you know, in a village, one person was uh, in a night uh, lost a valuable ring and he was looking for that ring under a light and he was desperately searching that uh, valuable ring, uh, which is made of a diamond maybe. And suddenly another person comes and start asking this guy, what happened? Have you lost anything? He said, yes, I have lost my uh, valuable ring and I'm searching this under this light. So um, this guy, the other guy asked him, are you sure that you are searching this uh, diamond ring under this light? Are you sure that you have lost it here? So the other guy says, my friend, no, I have not lost it here, but I have lost it one kilometer away from this light. So the other guy was surprised and said, why are you looking under this light then if you lost it one, one kilometer away from this light? So the other guy says, there is no light there. Only light is available here, so I'm searching for it. So the models are like this. The models, 
of valuations are like this because we, we when you talk about war model or we can talk about black shoal models and the options those are the models which is which we have and we have to use it whether they are good or bad we don't know because there's no light other than that model maybe but as a valuer as a professional we need to upgrade this model based on the drawback of the existing models which we have so there are a lot of drawbacks comes when you use the model and come to know and you need to upgrade that based on this um, your experience and that's why i said when you meet like this and new thoughts comes out and in, 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 and with those thoughts you can develop the model as you go up so we'll see that uh, as you go up uh, and uh, as amai also will be talking about var models and other things is the the var model originally what what had come out in risk matrix in 90s and now what various variations of var models are used by various people that has developed and has gone through a particular journey and that's the development of models which comes along with the experience so these are the two points which i want to highlight here which may not be relevant directly here but i just thought at the macro level this is the good thing but what i want to come to the main point of my uh, small brief session is as i'm working as uh, ms sangeeta said that i've been working with the bank of mauritius which is central bank of this country and also with imf whenever we work as a regulator and or as an imf um we i have come across various things which i wanted to highlight it today and i want to raise few question to this uh, you know learned group of valuers here because i think they can be the right person to give me the answer for it i many time i don't have the answer but i would raise this so maybe either today or in due in the future we can have more detailed discussion on this the theme which i want to raise it here today is financial valuation and financial stability what is financial valuation we all know what is financial stability which is a very key thing for any economy that your banks your key bank, financial institutions are stable and they should not fall in crisis so financial stability is the main criteria for any central banker any uh, when you talk about imf you will also think that okay any which is systemic important bank they should not fall so in during the crisis so financial stability is very important and what we have seen and what i have seen from my personal uh, experience that financial valuation and financial stability are highly correlated and that's why you people play a major role in the economy from that perspective i like to come to a point that there's a striking you know important striking features which you all talk about is the uncertainty about a true value of a complex financial instrument and since you were talking about var i'm raising this financial instrument part maybe a structured product a very exotic derivative we have a uncertainty quite a bit of uncertainty of the true value of those complex products as a financial instrument and because of that we see there are a lot of counterparties uncertainty risk position comes up because some people may default because of the high valuations and and so and so forth which lead to a contingent across asset classes and markets and region so you have seen because of structured products many financial institutions goes for a toss and that leads to financial instability for example let me come to a, a point which is very valid now in the across the world we are talking about it that the libor transition as libor is moving away and from 31st december we will not see libor in this world and libor has been quite a bit of a benchmark for various derivative and financial instruments and when we see that libor is going out and we'll be using the risk free rates we've been with central bank which is more backward looking and when we use this type of product in your valuation for benchmarking we have to be very careful and see that if that type of a risk free rates which will be coming into as a benchmark and leaving the libor whether that will impact your capital of the particular bank whether the mark to market losses may be on the very high side if you have whenever you see this transition coming into picture so as there's a lot of uncertainty comes from a fair value uh, of a financial instrument which is based on market but saying that i would also like to say the sound valuation is the central for to the internal risk management and uh, and capital requirement solvency and more broadly financial stability without valuation nothing happens so you are people are the base for all this a risk management cannot be done properly if you don't have proper valuations in other words valuation are the are heart of today's modern market based and risk sensitive financial system improvement in risk management financial reporting and solvency regulations 
have largely been concomitant and mutual reinforcement. And indeed, the widespread use of sophisticated risk measurement and management method across the financial industry has raised risk sensitivity and risk awareness among the system. Since the 90s, when value at risk came into existence uh, by risk metrics, uh, financial institutions have significantly improved their capacity to identify value and manage the various risks they hold in their balance sheets. Over time, the, the range of available measurement techniques had widened. And along with the you know, value at risk, which has become a very uniform part of the risk management tools in most of the financial institutions, the stress testing and other has also become a very common uh, tool and common uh, for risk management. The point I'm trying to bring home here is that the VAR stress testing and all this thing has become a very uniform tool for risk management. And along with this, another point which I would like to harp upon is that in parallel to this uh, VAR uniformity of risk management tools, the mark-to-market accounting in financial reporting has fostered transparencies and timely recognition of risk exposure and has contributed to the sharpening of market discipline. So one hand, you have uniformity of risk management tools, and on another hand, you have mark-to-market accounting norms, which is bringing a lot of discipline in your uh, market discipline. So valuation frameworks, when based on market prices, are contingent upon the existence of market values for financial instruments. For instance, value at risk techniques are, and are largely contingent upon the existence of reliable and relevant past market data to estimate the potential lot at a given confidence interval. That's basically what we all know about. And obviously, Amai will throw more light on it. But this leads to me a question which I want to raise it here. From now, I would love to raise a few questions to you people that uh, which we have seen coming into picture is whether valuation framework are adding excess volatility in financial statement and indirectly through the actions of their underpin the market prices. So basically I'm trying to ask you a question is that whether a mark to market valuations leads to volatility in financial statements. Why I'm saying this, I'll come to this. The fair value and the risk sensitivity are viewed as a right approach in circumstances where financial instruments are, have easily available market prices. So if you have a very good market prices, you can do fair value and risk sensitivity solvency regulations can come into picture. Fair value accounting also leads to discipline, as I said. But yet the problem comes here which we are trying to realize is that when there's an adverse market condition, that means marking to market together with, uh, may generate a feedback for a loop from expectation of market prices changes. So when market is going down, you're trying to create a mark to market uh, based on the falling market. And you are using tools like VAR and other thing, which is common to everyone. So if, so if let's, for example, I see, uh, 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 let's say an XYZ company, which is equity prices, based on equity prices, we do a VAR model. And we are having that equity in everyone's portfolio. And when the markets is tying down, the VAR numbers are also coming from based on that numbers from the market. So what will happen in this case is that we all will be behaving in the same manner. All will be behaving in the same manner. So we have seen that, uh, you know, this type of uniformity has led to market crashes also. Like for example, we have seen that during the crisis impact uh, war like techniques on market prices dynamics, because such techniques are used not only for risk measurement, but also for risk controls. And controls, when I say risk controls, I'm talking about war are used for position limit, covenant triggers, margin calls. And it has been argued that these techniques could have unintended pro-cyclical consequences. Simulation-based analysis suggests that the narrower the range of our techniques use risk management decisions across the industry. The more likely is that resulting investment decisions will be similar. And consequently, the market movements become self-enforcing. Self so financial products were fair valued 
despite concern that the current market prices are not an accurate reflection of products underlying cash flows or the price at which the instrument might be eventually be sold sales decision based on this fair value pricing is a weak in a weak market with the already falling prices resulting in a further decline in market prices reflecting market illiquidity premium so what i'm trying to say here is additionally is that when the uniform price uh, risk management um, uh, uh, tools with a uniform portfolio with a uniform mark to market uh, uh, accounting norms may not be the right type of thing during a falling market but that is a very good thing for a rising market so in other word the standardization in risk management against the backdrop of mark to market accounting may reduce the diversity in investment strategy across market participants a situation which may be sub optimal from a financial stability perspective so what i'm trying to say is that let's say there are five banks in an economy and all five banks are using same type of risk management tool they are using the same type of mark to market and more or less they are investing in good products so the same type of portfolios are there more or less now if this market starts crashing everybody will be uh, trying to trying to sell it and there may not be liquidity and there nobody will be a buyer there so think from that perspective if there this type of risk management tools which is very good in up market may not be so good in the lower, uh, lower market or the downside market against this background it, i think this is an interesting topic which i am trying to raise it here because you people are experienced people you can do some bit of research and find out that what type of combination we should look for a risk management modeling and mark to market model or uh, average cost accounting what type of combination you should work in it in terms of accounting in terms of valuation in terms of disclaimer what you should do it in practice financial stability may benefit from the existence of valuation and accounting rules that are more sensitive to differences in investment horizon that's the topic which is i was like thinking of that you know you can have a variety of accounting norms or a variety of uh, risk management tools uh, to some extent instead of just uniform risk management and risk management, uh, you know accounting rules for for up market and for a down market there are a lot of research which is going on and because we have seen that during the crisis time this type of problem arises when the markets are up mark to market very good all tools are very good but when the markets are going down in crisis situation let's say post covid or let's say 2008 debacle subprime debacle all this thing this, this type of debate comes into picture and as a valuer i think that we have to come back to see that how we can you know take care of such thing why i'm raising this i'm not trying to criticize var model or any other model what i'm trying to i try, what i'm trying to bring home here is that that this type of model which is a very good strong model may behave differently in different market condition a bullish market or a bearish market will have a different conditions and that may have a implication from a financial stability perspective so that's the point i wanted to bring home today i'm sure uh you'll be uh, you know you must be if you have any more questions we can always have a discussions on this going forward uh, my emails and everything is there and if you want we can have a detailed discussion on this because many of the central banks and other we have done quite a bit of research on this that financial valuation and financial stability how it goes how is correlated through monetary modeling so with that uh, basic uh, you know some of the thoughts i would like to leave it here and would love if you have any questions at the end uh, but at the same time uh, i would uh, wish uh, amay uh, all the best i think and you people should listen to him he's a great speaker and he's a thorough uh, so with that uh, i thank you for inviting me thanks a lot thank you sir for inviting us uh, with this wonderful deliberation uh, certainly questions put in by you our speaker will throw light on this and uh, we will certainly have uh, your lecture as a speaker because you are also much having much knowledge and a wonderful topic we can have in the full fledged webinar where you can deliberate and now our member ca sejal agarwal will give avp presentation and give introduction of speaker of the day and then we will go ahead okay sejal yes your turn yes. thank you sir 
Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep sir. And uh, good evening, everyone, all respected dignitaries. This is C.A. Sejal Agrawal from Ahmedabad, practicing chartered accountant since 10 years. Thank you, Bhavya sir and Sandeep sir for giving me this opportunity to present our uh, AVP presentation. So, is my screen has been shared? Is screen visible? Yes, 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 it is visible. Yes, so uh, it's my proud privilege to present our uh, presentation on our AVP organization. Uh, our organization is Association of Valuation Professionals that everyone knows. Uh, Mr. Ramon Bhaveji, he is a founder member and president of AVP. His sole objective is of AVP is to work in national interest and in professionalizing valuation as vocation, as everyone knows. He is having great insight to mentor each and every person. He is actually involved in many other things rather than founding this AVP group. And we are really obliged to have him, sir. We are having tie-ups with many of other organizations like IIVF, uh, once our AVP group, that is Association of Valuation Professions, that everyone knows. Then IIV, India Registered Valuer Foundations, and then SME. We are having tie-up with these organizations also. Now, what is AVP? AVP is an organization wherein all the valuable knowledge regarding the valuations has been uh, interested candidates who wants to become a member of this flat membership can become a member by just paying rupees 5000 only that is one time fee if a person is a registered valuer also he can he can pay 1500 rupees additional so that cpi hours can be credited in that account this organization is not for only for the valuers but also for all other members also those who are keenly interested in valuations so what are the milestones that have been achieved by us within eight months? We have already tie up our CPRs with IIV, RVF, RVO Pune. We have already 152 members from foreign countries as well. Very iconic personalities like past president from ICMAI, internationally certified valuers, prominent speakers. We have already issued eight e-newsletters and one special Independence Day special newsletter. We have already conducted 38 webinars having varieties of knowledge and covering different topics. IIVF is a foundation that has been recognized by RBVI and we are having tie up with them for CP hours. If a person who is a registered valuer and becomes a member by paying 5,000, he needs to pay additional annually 1,500 plus GST for getting CP hours credited. We are having SME chambers of India also tie up with them. They are mainly involved in working for developments of SME for manufacturing and service sector. So why do we, first of all, we have a Mr. Ramon Bhaveji, our founder member and a president to insight, to provide insight and reach with knowledge of valuations every now and then. Even he is providing free tuition classes also so that many of the persons who are not a valuer can become a valuer. Even we recently, in our group, two members have become a registered valuer by mentoring students by him. So it's a great opportunity for everyone to learn and to prosper. So they are mentoring newly registered valuers. Then we are having monthly e newsletter that already told. Networking is again a very important for each and every field. So we are having networking also here, chance to attend international webinar at a discounted prices. We have a discounted prices also. We normally conduct once in a week where, though we used to say that we have monthly twice, but we normally used to have once weekly or 15 days weekly webinars. And for CP hours, we have a tie with IIVF so that we can have credit of CP hours also. We need not to have another webinars for CP hours. So we have already around 23 upcoming webinars wherein varieties of different topics can be seen and varieties of main major dignitaries have been 
added as in speaker and when and very valuable chief guest has also been added so that the webinars can be very successful so for any of the queries kindly contact mr ram mohan bhavi ji for membership assistance nitin brahma ji and for webinar related queries mr sandeep agrawal i would like to give my gratitude towards sandeep agrawal ji also who always used to motivate us at young, young rvs to participate in webinars and have an act with him so yes that was all for avp presentation and now uh, it's my proud privilege to introduce our speaker today mr Am amir p abhyankar cfa cqf he is going to give a webinar at on a topic like value at risk that is like no one may have listened or no one may have heard that what actual this webinar means to so it's going to be a great learning so very welcome warm, warm welcome mr abhyankar ji so let me have a brief introduction about him he is having a current role that is winquest institute founder started operations in november 20 he is from mumbai he is mainly involved in training programs for finance quantitative analytics and programming for financial applications training programs for candidates appearing for financial risk management then grf institute usa career counseling services for students and working professionals risk consulting projects in the industries previous work experiences is about he is having 12 years of more experience uh, in an industry like indusland bank then consulting nomura research institute deloitte software wipro academics and professional qualifications that he is a cfa chartered financial analyst cfa institute usa certificate in quantitative finance cqf cqf institute uk so he is having both the qualifications from usa and uk certificate in machine learning for finance machine learning is like uh, ye kya ho gaya for chartered accountants MLI Institute UK MBA Finance University of Pune Bachelor's of Engineering University of Pune he has been serving as a visiting faculty at GIPE Pune Willinkar Institute of Management Meghna Desai Academy Mumbai he normally used to publish articles regularly on various topics in quantitative finance capital markets and python for finance python so it's all these are all normal a new words for us and it's going to be a great learning sir so by this i would just conclude my introduction for our honorable speaker to address all and cast the light of his knowledge upon us we would be extremely delighted with your expertise and knowledge in every way possible sir so without consuming any more time i request you to address the audience and enlighten us with the words of true wisdom thank you sir thank you madam thank you for the introduction and thank you for the kind words uh, and once again uh, thanks to uh, uh, bhave sir sandeep ji uh, and mr sanjeev sawal of course and sanjeev sir and i have worked in deloitte earlier as well so uh, so thanks to all of you and uh, avp uh, as an organization for having me over uh, so great uh, and also i mean thanks to dr chiragra for setting the ball rolling through his insightful uh, thoughts uh, at the start of the class uh so uh, uh let me share my screen i prepared a few discussion points for today so allow me to just share screen and i think uh, sejal's screen is still visible here please close your screen now yeah all right yeah so is my screen visible to everyone yes yes now it is oh great all right so uh, we'll understand what is value at risk so a few points which i have put together for today uh so this introduction bit and uh, madam has already done so we can just skip over this thing so this thing will not be required but uh, then we'll understand uh, the concept of risk so most of us have been uh, work have been, maybe we have read about risk management or what is risk analytics etc but generally getting a quick overview of what is risk then a few types of risks because just like any quantity even risk has a few varieties so the common types of risks which we are commonly exposed to in uh, the bfsi space uh that is something which we will understand next we'll talk about a process uh, because uh, although we are talking of value at risk value at risk is like a modeling methodology which we use for understanding it so before we actually go to the model it always makes sense to understand what the process for uh 
for the risk management phase so that we know exactly where the model fits in. And when we understand war, I have divided this into a few heads. So we'll understand the concept of war first because I feel uh, that conceptual clarity is very, very important. Uh, once that is uh, once that is done, then uh, everything becomes very, very uh, easy to understand. Next, we'll uh, do a brief overview of a few models and value at risk. Sorry, I think my screen sharing stopped. Uh, let me reshare. Okay. Uh, so a few models on value at risk, then uh, we'll spend some time understanding historical simulation war. So this is one of the popular techniques which we use in the industry and something which market participants as well as the regulators uh, have accepted and uh, we have been using this for a very long time. So we we'll try to understand what that approach is. Next, we'll explore a bit on the role of technology in risk management, because technology is something which is making inroads into every industry. And the financial services industry is, uh, is not a stranger to technology as well. So we'll understand how exactly technology is reshaping uh, the entire risk management process as such. And we'll talk a bit on the regulatory aspects of VAR as well, because finally, whatever things we do, uh, they are within uh, what the regulatory guidelines stipulate. So uh, VAR, again, is one of the important metrics which comes handy whenever we, we have to do any kind of reporting activities to the, either to the regulator or even for our internal MIS projects. Uh, so I request uh, you all to park your questions to the end so that we can have uh, a discussion uh, in, during the Q&A time. And I have a few slides, so, uh, so I won't bore you too much. I mean, I've just uh, tried to have uh, the like, uh, material condensed in a fewer number of slides, and it'll be more of discussions uh, which will be helpful. So, so let's begin. So, this slide, Madam, has already given my introduction, so we can simply skip over. So we'll understand with definition of risk. So, when we hear the word risk, uh, what comes to our mind is uh, something like an uncertainty, or maybe uh, technically. I mean, if anyone is from maybe a statistics background, they may say standard deviation or even volatility. So yes, I mean, all are different uh, ways of explaining what risk is. So whenever we are uncertain about an outcome of something, we say there is a certain risk associated with it. So I can give you two simple examples whereby we don't have a risk and in the second scenario where we have a risk. So imagine a very uh, simple example whereby, let's say I have uh, a sum of 100 rupees with me and I have to park that money with, uh, with my neighborhood bank. Uh, for now, for this example, we imagine that the bank is not going to default. So uh, I take my 100 rupees, I go to the bank, and I park it inside a time deposit. So something which we call as a fixed deposit. And let's say it's for one year's time, and the bank is paying me a rate of, let's say, 5%. So after one year, I receive 105 rupees back uh, as a return from uh, for, for the funds which I've invested with the bank. So this is what I call as a transaction whereby there is no risk because we have assumed that the market is not going to default and that I'm going to receive my money back. Whereas contrast this with uh, uh, investment in equity markets or capital markets. So let's say tomorrow I go and purchase shares of XYZ company. Then naturally I'm bringing on risk onto my books because anything which happens on the capital markets is going to impact my position as well. So at that time, I need to be wary of the kind of risk which I'm carrying on my books. And this is a scenario whereby uh, there is some bit of risk involved. Now, how much amount of risk is to be taken, et cetera, is uh, that goes into the gamut of what you understand as risk threshold, risk tolerance, or even risk appetite of organization. So we'll not get into those uh, things too much because time may not be enough for us to cover a war then because they themselves are uh, large topics uh, as well. So we'll... Uh, leave it there and we'll uh, continue with our discussion. Then understanding the role of risk being uh, risk from a strategic point of view. So every firm or every organization has a certain long-term strategic vision. So maybe for a bank, a vision can be that in the next 10 years, we want to become the largest lender in a certain jurisdiction. So that can be like a vision for the bank or an organization. So, uh, so if you allow me, I can combine point number two and point number three and explain this uh, idea. So earlier, 
uh, if you see, so if you ask someone, say in the year 1995, or maybe even in early 2000s, that uh, do you see risk as a, a cost center or do you see risk as something else? Then the natural answer would have been, and risk is just a cost center, and they are there to report the numbers and, uh, and they create various MIS reports that circulated internally as well as give it to the uh, regulator as well. But uh, come 2008, 2007, 2008, the financial crisis, and after that as well, banks and financial institutions have begun to realize the importance of risk. So now, rather than viewing risk just as a cost center, now a bank or a management looks at risk more as a value-adding function. So when I say a value-adding function, the role of risk has, uh, has increased when it comes to any strategic decision which a management has to do. So let's say the management uh, talks of a certain strategic investment and they say from a long-term perspective, this investment may give good returns to the bank. Then before actually committing funds to that kind of an investment proposal, uh, what the management will do is they'll consult risk management to see if, uh, to, to get an idea of what risk department feels as well. Because they know that risk department uh, has uh, insights on the kind of risk which we add onto the books. And that way, they'll be much better positioned in order to make that decision if they have some inputs from risk. So, so that, is, uh, that is a way in which the perception of risk has changed. And if you see globally, and the size of risk teams is rising because organizations have become risk aware. And everyone has begun to appreciate the role which risk managers play. So that way, I expect that role to increase in the near future as well, because finally, financial innovation is something which will always go on. So that brings me to point number four on this slide. So innovations are always on in finance. So you, we always have innovative products which keep on coming. So depending on the demand of the market, uh, banks and financial institutions can structure and market new type of products to uh, the industry. And that way you have various market participants who may wish to uh, buy or even trade on those products. So whenever you have such innovative products coming in or new products coming in, then there is naturally a, a very good chance that an additional amount of risk is being added to the overall market. So that way, if you have innovation in the financial product space, naturally you should have uh, innovation on the risk space as well, because you are not expected to uh, use age-old risk techniques in order, in order to understand sophisticated financial products in the market. Because if there is an imbalance in the two, then you'll not be able to understand the kind of risk which you're carrying on the books. So that's why risk management is also an area whereby there is an immense amount of research and innovation which is on. And they're trying to stay in lockstep with uh, the advancements which are happening in the financial services domain, especially from a new products perspective. So this was a very brief on uh, what was risk and the kind of uh, role which risk is playing these days. Now let's try to understand a few types of risks. So we'll uh, start off with uh, market risk because since we are talking of value at risk as a measure, that is that comes under the gamut of market risk. So when we talk of market risk, a market risk implies the risk from fluctuations in the various market parameters to which our portfolio is exposed to. So uh, market parameters are also what you call as risk factors, or I'll call it as RF per shot. So every financial asset which you see in the market will have a certain set of relevant risk factors to which it is exposed to. And uh, as a part of market risk, we need to understand the kind of uh, risks which you are carrying on the books. So whenever these risk factor values change, my position of that particular asset on the portfolio also moves. Uh, you can say, let's say my MTM valuation moves. So uh, a few risk factors, which I've enlisted here, it could be interest rate, it could be FX rates, it could be commodity prices, inflation rates, credit spreads, et cetera. Now, movements in any of these parameters are going to impact those respective products uh, which are sitting on my portfolio. Next is credit risk. So credit risk is something which is very, very important from a bank's perspective. Because when you talk of credit risk, the first thing which comes to our mind is the default risk. So uh, and I just leave aside the bank for some time. Now imagine that uh, we are back in college and our parents used to give us pocket money. So let's say our parents used to give us, let's say, 500 rupees a month uh, as pocket money. So uh, imagine that uh, I have managed to save money and let's say I'm surplus 200 rupees. Uh, let's say tomorrow is the month end and I still have 200 rupees excess with me. 
and imagine that my best friend comes to me and says that ki uh, are i am short of funds i need 200 rupees uh, from you uh, i'll definitely return it in the next month uh, but i need to purchase an xyz thing so for that i need that excess money so yes i mean i know yes he is my good friend and uh, he or she they definitely return my money back but even at that point we used to be concerned that what would be what would happen if that person doesn't return our money so that was at a very small scale isn't it so imagine what would happen from a bank's perspective now whenever a bank is lending to a borrower so let's say they are uh, lending crores of rupees to a borrower and uh, then imagine the kind of risk which the bank is taking so therefore before uh, disbursing any kind of money the bank is going to do a comprehensive credit risk analysis because they want to ensure that they have all the safeguards in place before they actually make any kind of uh, uh, any kind of loan disbursement to an xyz borrower so this is what we study under credit risk so things like default risk uh, then credit downgrade risk so when i say default risk it can either be a partial default or a complete default or uh, things like credit downgrade whereby uh, let's say there is a certain downgrade in the credit rating for a certain instrument which happens now all of these things are what we consider as a part of credit risk next comes operational risk so operational risk mainly looks at things like systems risk human intervention risk any kind of uh, external factors like catastrophic risks or even uh, cyber attack risks etc now all of these things are studied by operational risk specialists next you have liquidity risk so liquidity risk many a times we study that along with market risk so there's a reason why we do that so when we talk of liquid liquidity risk you can imagine that uh, liquidity risk most of the time manifests itself as a price risk so uh, a simple example to demonstrate that so let's say i have a certain product which i have uh, let's say i have a certain uh, a product which i want to uh, which i want to sell to the market and imagine it's a very illiquid product that is there are hardly any people or hardly any buyers in the market who would be willing to purchase that product from me so uh, and i have a very sophisticated model which says that on a face value of 100 that particular asset is worth let's say 85 rupees now tomorrow if i go to the market and say that i want to sell this uh, product to you then the market would say fine i mean uh, it's a product which you want to offer but there's no demand for that kind of product so although you say it's 85 we feel it's just 75 rupees so they may say it's either take it or leave it so you trade at 75 or uh, the trade doesn't go through so this is what i call as a price risk and we can relate that from a liquidity perspective because whenever i have any asset which is in liquid in nature that is going to make it very difficult for me to offload it at a certain point in time and if i do have to offload it i need to be ready to take a certain price hit so lower the liquidity uh, naturally higher will be the expected price hit which i would have to take so liquidity risk is something which we study along with market risk because under market risk we talk of mpms which is nothing but the pricing uh, as we call it or even mark to market so many a times liquidity risk and market risk are something which we study together and even if you observe in banks uh, you have teams which we call as mr plus lr which is market risk plus liquidity risk so you have specialists from the mr side as well as few people from lr side they combine their forces together and then they help in overall risk management perspective from the marketer side of things next is compliance risk now the last two types of risk compliance and reputation these are more from legal side so i'm sure uh, many of our participants would be from the legal background as well uh, so uh, i mean expertise from uh, legal side comes in whenever we talk of these types of risks because whenever we talk of anything on regulatory risks or even internal risks or anything to do with your reputation now all of these things are something for which you require expertise from the legal side of it because we know that reputation is something which is very very dear isn't it reputation takes years to build but for destruction of the reputation it hardly takes a few weeks so that way every organization is very very sensitive to these kind of risks so that's why they have specialists who are going to uh, manage these kind of risks for them so if you ask me from a quantitative perspective uh market risk and credit risk are very very quantitatively intensive uh type of roles operational risk i would say it's the mix so it's a mix of operational risk plus uh, sorry it's a mix of uh quantitative plus uh qualitative skills again liquidity risk is more uh as a function of market risk so that way uh, uh that way i can say liquidity risk is more of a subset of market risk possibly 
So these were a few types of risks. Now let's understand the risk management process. So uh, we'll we'll go to the modeling bit in a bit, uh, in some time, but uh, let's understand how exactly uh, the risk process works in a bank or a financial institution. So there are five steps. So first is understanding what exactly is the risk that we are uh, that we are trying to understand. Because unless we know exactly what we are trying to manage, there is no way in which we can have a proper risk management process to help us do that. So as a very first thing, uh, we have to define what risk we are facing. So since this is a market risk presentation, uh, I'll say that it is the risk of losses arising from the movement in market prices. So as I mentioned, the fluctuations in uh, market variables or uh, market risk factors is going to result in market prices getting impacted as well. So that way, and I'm calling this as the kind of risk which I'm trying to manage. So this is the what is it portion. Next is the identification of different risk factors. So now, now that I know the kind of risk which I'm trying to manage, uh, I need to identify various risk factors which, uh, which are going to impact my book. Now, I would say that understanding the risk factors or identification is a very, very important step because it should not happen that... Uh, uh, we are we are having a certain type of product on the book, and we are mapping some, uh, uh, or we have mapped some random risk factor which we are unable to basically, uh, or our model is unable to comprehend. So, uh, just to give you a simple example, let's say I have a simple bond position, or let's say I have a certain fixed income product which is sitting on my book. Imagine a government security. Then we know that government security prices will be impacted only by the movements in the yields of government bonds. We don't have to worry about anything else. So if I'm holding a plain GSEC, then it's the interest rates which I should have mapped in my system. So these are what I can call as my risk factors. So interest rates become the only risk factor which I'm exposed to. Now tomorrow, let's say my front office, that is my trading division, decides to say that it decides to start trading non SDR bonds, that is those bonds which are non-government in nature, so something like corporate debt. Then I need to take into consideration the the credit spreads as well. So along with interest rates, I need to start sourcing credit spreads in my system because that is something which is going to help me understand the kind of market risk which that product is adding on my books. Let's say next week, my front office decides that uh, we want to start transacting in FX options. Then uh, I would need to have foreign exchange rates, volatilities, et cetera, uh, to be mapped in my system as well. So that identification becomes a key. So this is where expertise from risk managers is required because if we are unable to pinpoint the kind of risk which we are going to face, we'll, we'll never be able to manage that risk. And also there is a fine balance from an optimization perspective. So why I say optimization? Because imagine that I hold a plain government securities portfolio, but I'm sourcing everything. Let's say interest rates, spreads, FX rates, commodity prices, equity prices, et cetera. I mean, a few factors which I've enlisted here. Now, honestly, that is not really required at that point in time, isn't it? Because uh, let's say in the foreseeable future, my traders say that we are going to transact only government securities. Then I should not overload my system uh, I, I mean, unnecessarily with all of these newer risk factors, which are not really impacting my position. Because finally, remember, whenever we are having any kind of models, uh, they are going to be sitting on our system infrastructure. And the system's infrastructure is always limited. So there are only a limited number of uh, resources which are available for uh, different teams in the bank to consume. So that we always try to think from an optimization perspective so that we know uh, how exactly the system resources are getting used so that everyone uh, everyone gets a chance to, ex uh, to execute their types of processes in a standardized manner. Uh, let me just close the window. Uh, there are some firecrackers outside so it's uh, causing some disturbance. My apologies. Next come the actual measurement part. So when we talk of actual measurement, these are the VAR models which we are going to understand. So we require some type of model to understand the kind of risk or measure the kind of risk which I'm carrying on the books. So that's why you have these VAR or uh, value at risk models. So we'll spend some time understanding VAR as well. Uh, next then comes control. Because yes, I mean, we have uh, identified the risk, we have identified risk parameters, we have measured the risk. But finally, you require some kind of a mechanism to control that risk as well. Because
because unless you have a certain effective control mechanism, it's not going to help. So things to control risk can be uh, board approved policies, standardized processes, which are going to be used uh, by the bank and also a limits framework. So limits is something which Dr. Chiragra touched upon as well. So this comes from your exposure management perspective. So you have real time limits which are there, which are to be monitored and which help in overall risk management. So you can relate this with your overall risk threshold or risk appetite point of view. And then you require monitoring. So risk is not a do once and forget process. That is like an ongoing process which has to be done. So that's why you require a continuous feedback. loop. So you can imagine monitoring is very, very similar to a feedback condition. So uh, that way we understand whether the risk is getting uh, managed correctly. And for that, you have a proper system of reports which get generated. So these are also what you call as MIS reports or, or these are called as management information system. So MIS reports are there for your internal management consumption as well as for the consumption of your regulators. So you can easily have these kind of effective reports which are configured and which can be uh, uh, which can be generated and uh, shared uh, shared to the requested requ request stakeholders. So this is in general how a risk process looks like. Uh, so I've done this for market risk, but this is valid for other types of risks as well. So tomorrow, if we want to have a risk process for credit risk, I mean, oh, only a few things will change. So rather than market prices, we would be worried about maybe the overall credit rating of the borrower. And maybe the market risk factors can be uh, a few things which are pertinent to, let's say, the credit borrower. So those kind of things could change. But more or less, these heads are not going to change. These five heads will remain more or less same, depending on whichever risk we are looking at. So this is in brief uh, as to what a risk process is. Now. Let's come Let's to the come concept to the of VAR or value at risk. So again, uh, uh, the value at risk is a very, very important metric. So something which we uh, widely use in the industry. Uh, now, before we go to value at risk, uh, now, can I, uh, uh, now can I ask that, uh, is everyone familiar with the concept of probability distributions? And, and are you familiar with things like confidence intervals, et cetera? So have you had a chance to work on any of these things in the past? Okay, okay. Because uh, value at risk as a metric is related to these uh, these type of concepts when we talk of probability distributions, et cetera. Because uh, whenever we talk of war, you are uh, just to give you an overview of uh, why exactly we understand risk from this probability distribution perspective. Now, if I go back uh, to the definition of risk, we say it's an uncertainty in my outcome. So that is what I call as risk. So if I draw a simple normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution as we call it. And let's say this is my expected value. So for any distribution, there are two parameters which define the distribution. One is the mean and one is the standard deviation. So depending on these two values, you can define any type of distribution you have. So we have normal, log normal, uh, and standardized normal distributions, binomial distributions, et cetera. So we'll talk of a simple normal distribution here. So let's say this line, so let's say I call this as zero. Let's say this is my expected value. So expected value is what you call as the mean of the distribution or mu uh, from this particular notation. So this is what you call as the expected value. Now, any deviations from this expected value is what we call as a risk, uh, or that is the kind of risk which we are uh, being, that we are exposed to. So when I say deviations, can I say that these are fluctuations away from my expected long-term mean? So it can be on either sides. So on either sides, when I move, there is a certain bit of risk which I'm exposed to. So this is what we call as standard deviation. So standard deviation explains the kind of fluctuations which we have away from the expected value of a certain parameter. And this is what you call as the risk of, of that particular distribution. So for every asset which we study, especially from option pricing or even from risk management perspective, there is always an underlying probability distribution which gets associated with it. And this is how a simple probability distribution looks like. Now, so with this idea, uh, we'll be able to understand the value at risk concept in a far better manner. 
So uh, when we talk of value at risk, there is a concept which we call as confidence intervals. So I'll just write one statement and then I'll explain how to interpret that statement. So that will help us understand what uh, VAR means. So let's say there's some statement and it reads 99% one day VAR is uh, rupees one crores. So let's say this is a statement which I get uh, and which I'm trying to interpret. So 99%, this is the kind, this is the confidence interval, interval which I was talking about. So when I say it's a 99% one day war and it's one cross, the way to interpret that is I am 99% confident that over the next one day, my portfolio loss will not exceed one crore. I'll just repeat the definition because it's important. So the way to understand this is, I am 99% confident that over the next one day, my portfolio loss will not exceed one crore rupees. So this is how I can interpret this statement. So, so here you see for defining value at risk, there are two parameters which become very, very important. One is my confidence interval. And second is the holding period. So these two parameters are what are going to drive my overall VAR or value at risk measure. So from a regulatory perspective, these are two common uh, numbers which we use. So we have, uh, sorry, we have a 99% uh, that is confidence interval and a one day VAR. So from your regulatory VAR perspective from market risk, this is something which is required. Now there is something called a stress VAR as well. So stress VAR looks at a 10 day holding period. So uh, a slight variation, but again, it's a related concept. So, uh, so for war, I mean, these are two measures can completely define uh, what exactly we are trying to manage. So uh, if I had to give a definition to war, you can imagine this to be like uh, a single number, which is going to help me understand what is the risk which I'm carrying on my, on my book. So let's say I have a war for a fixed income portfolio. So let's say I have a very large fixed income portfolio. So I have... Uh, a collection of bonds which are part of my book so i may have a var number for that fixed income portfolio so that will basically uh, tell me that for this particular portfolio after running it through a value at risk model this is the var number that is this is the kind of risk which is there which is being contributed by that particular portfolio so and uh, in a nutshell this is what you mean by value at risk and you should always relate this from this distribution perspective because uh, why I brought this diagram was uh, uh, because we understand diagrams far better. So if I had started with the definition directly without giving you a background of this, it would have become slightly difficult to understand. So that's why I mean this pictorial representation. So even so, Jani, I mean, whenever we're picking up any new concept, it always helps if we have a certain pictorial view of things because uh, our human brain is basically trained that way. And we understand pictorial pictorial representation in a much better manner as compared to, let's say, reading a 10-page paragraph or maybe a 10-line paragraph. So uh, so that's why uh, this discussion. But yes, I mean, always try to relate VAR from a distribution perspective, and then the concept becomes pretty easy. So there is a reason why VAR has become such a widely used metric by not just industry participants, but by regulators as well. Uh, now, the main reason behind that is VAR is one single number. So I'll tell you the convenience of that. So, and the main reason is convenience and overall risk management uh, ideas. So imagine that I have a thousand bonds in my portfolio. And uh, imagine that the concept of VAR does not exist. And let's say I'm using duration. So I, we have a concept which we call as bond duration, uh, which we use for understanding the risk of a bond. So duration uh, in a nutshell is nothing but the interest rate sensitivity of the bond. So let's say for these thousand bonds, I'm calculating thousand durations and I'm reporting it to the to my management as, as well as to the regulator. Now, the MIS report, which I sent to the management, my management will not understand the head or tail of what I have done because and it's a very large position and they don't have that much time to go through thousand duration numbers. And even if they do, it will be very hard to understand or uh, relate to the overall risk which I'm carrying on the book. So uh, from an understanding perspective, it can be a challenge. Now, in contrast to this, compare that I have one single VAR number which I'm reporting. So rather than 1,000 numbers, there is one VAR number which I report. So let's say today my VAR is maybe 50 lakh rupees. Uh, tomorrow, uh, let's say the VAR moves to 
moves to one crore rupees. Then that way, I know that there is a fifty lakh movement which has happened in VAR. So, uh, so that way, I know that there is uh, some bit of risk which has been added on my books, and I, as a part of risk management, might be might want to uh, dig deeper to understand from where exactly that risk is coming. So, a couple of places from where that additional risk can come in. One can be either. uh my trader has added a very huge fixed income position or maybe there was a significant movement in market parameters which has resulted in uh my overall var number getting pushed up but that way whenever we have that kind of a number to compare then i know that the risk has increased or maybe the risk has decreased if it moves in the other the other direction but i as a part of risk management should be able to interpret what that movement is and from that perspective as well var becomes to be var is a very very useful concept and that's why it is something which is widely accepted by the regulators as well as by industry participants both for mis reporting and for regulatory reporting as well now a uh, picture the representation of var so now we know the concept of distribution so we have shown the distribution there so if i just quickly show the distribution once again now uh now i'll give you a hint so you can reply in the chat as well so i want to uh plot value at risk on one side of the distribution so should i plot the var on the left hand side or should i plot the var on the right hand side of the distribution so uh, so where exactly that is to be plotted we'll see but uh which side should it be should it be on the right side of the distribution or should it be on the left side of the distribution what's your guess okay so it should be on the left side of the distribution now now why left side because we are talking of risk and whenever we are talking of risk we should always be concerned of the losses which our portfolio will be exposed to and the left hand side of the distribution always takes care of the losses bit whereas the right hand side is a profit now right hand side i need not worry because the thing is if i am profitable i will be more than happy isn't it now uh, my bank is making money or my portfolio is making money so i am happy with it there is no problem but problem comes in whenever i look at the left side of the distribution so left side talks about the losses which i am carrying on uh, on my books so from a value at risk perspective we should always focus on the left side of the distribution and more precisely left tail of the distribution so let's say this is the 99th percentile cross section which i draw here so it is this percentile number which i have to report as a part of var so uh, again uh, i'm just relating it to this definition which i have shown here so i'm looking at a 99% confidence interval now tomorrow if the regulator says we don't want 99% we want 95% fine we'll simply move the confidence interval so rather than 99% we we'll look up the number which appears at a 95% and that way we'll report the var so uh just one related concept which we call as expected shortfall so expected shortfall uh tries to explain uh what is the maximum loss which i'll be exposed to so something which is beyond var as well so you can imagine expected shortfall to be like a conditional probability so again uh in probability we have a couple of concepts we have unconditional probability and we have a conditional probability so when we have a unconditional probability that means uh let's say there is a certain event a and we are trying to measure the probability of that event a so let's say it's a simple uh, uh simple roll of die so that way i have one piece of die which i am simply rolling and i have a certain probability that a certain number will come up so it's 16 so this is what you call as a unconditional probability now uh a conditional probability is whereby you have two events which are related to each other that is let's say uh i'm trying to understand what is the probability of a certain event to occur given that certain other event has already happened so that is what you call as uh, or and this is the definition which i can relate to expected shortfall so basically what expected shortfall talks about is it will say fine your var limit has already breached but beyond that what is the maximum loss which you'll be exposed to so that is the tail loss which i am talking about so there is still 1% here isn't it so there is still 1% in my extreme left tail which is still remaining because i am looking at a 99% number beyond this there is still a 1 percentage area which is there so that is something which expected shortfall will try and explain 
So that way, uh, whenever we talk from a banking perspective, you have a VAR and a expected shortfall as a measure which is calculated on a day-to-day -day basis. That's a regulatory requirement. So that has to be computed daily and which has to be used for both MIS reporting as well as for your regulatory reporting perspective. Next, understanding a few approaches to valuators. So one, one is historical simulation. In short, this is also what you call as a HSVAR approach. So this is by far the most popular approach which we use uh, in the industry. So uh, I'll also tell you why this approach is popular and uh, why industry uses this extensively. Next is Monte Carlo simulation. So yes, I mean, Monte Carlo simulations have a lot of applications. So they can be used for asset price simulation or even in cor certain corporate finance activities or maybe even in things like maybe uh, ESOP option valuation, etc. But uh, again, uh, Monte Carlo has applications in uh, in this war bit as well. But there are a certain drawbacks of the Monte Carlo engine. So we'll talk about that. So we won't spend too much time understanding Monte Carlo simulation because that becomes a very quantitatively intensive exercise. So we'll uh, just touch upon uh, simulation. And I'll tell you uh, a few things of Monte Carlo, uh, which, may, uh, which may make them less appealing to market participants. Next is a cash flow mapping approach. So cash flow mapping approach comes handy whenever you have a significant amount of structured debt or structured bonds on the portfolio or structured fixed income if I have to call it. So that way, and a very, very popular technique used by hedge funds uh, who have a lot of structured debt on their books, uh, but for banks or for financial institutions, not really, and they don't really use much of cash flow mapping. Uh, Delta gamma approach, this is a quick approach. So that way, uh, this will give you a quick answer. Of course, there are certain shortcomings for that as well. So if you ask me from a regulatory perspective, not just in India, but globally as well, uh, banks generally prefer historical simulation or HSVAR approach as we call it. So let's try to understand what HSVAR is. So I've drawn a simple block diagram to explain what historical simulation VAR is so that uh, we understand uh, the concept. Yeah, so this is a simple uh, model which we can see for uh, a valuator's calculation. So as a very first step, we have risk factor identification or RF identification, uh, as I mentioned. So if you recollect, this is the very first step in my process. So when we talk of RF identification, I'm trying to identify the kind of risk parameters which I'm exposed to. So let's say uh, I, I have a certain, a certain bond. So imagine a very simple product, I have a bond. And I'm trying to understand the risk of that particular bond. So what we'll do is uh, I'll explain these things. So although this is a pictorial diagram, I can quickly show you a demonstration on the whiteboard. So it will take just about 10 minutes time, 10 to 15 minutes time, but it will make the concept really clear because these are just placeholders for the kind of calculations which I ought to demonstrate. Again, it will keep the calculations to be very, very generic and simple so that you know exactly the essence of VAR. So once you understand that approach and uh, relating it to this diagram becomes very, very easy. So allow me to switch to my whiteboard and I'll quickly show you a demonstration there so that we have full clarity on the concept because that conceptual clarity is important. So let's take a very, very simple product. So imagine that I have just one government security on my book and imagine the government security has two years to maturity and or even for to things to keep things even simple, I'll say it has an annual coupon. That is, I have just a coupon which gets paid out at the end of every year. So I have a two-year bond which pays out annual coupon. So if I have to just write the bond here quickly, this will be it has a time to maturity of two years. It's a government security, and it has a coupon frequency of of annual. And let's say some C percent coupon, and that doesn't matter. We keep it generic. And let's say this is one single bond which I have, and I want to calculate the value at risk for this particular bond. So, which I call as a HS bar or historical separation bar. So, I'm going to show you a simple uh, show. I mean, it's about a five or six step process uh, which we can do for calculation of HS bar. So, I'll demonstrate that here so that we have uh, an idea of what exactly I have written on the slides as well. So as so, I'll just label these tables so that it becomes easy for us to reference them later. So let's have a table A. So table A will be my input table. 
So when I say inputs, you can imagine this is my input risk factor table. And I know that risk factors are nothing but the market risk parameters which are going to impact my bot or impact my product. Now I'm holding a government security. So this is a GSEC. So all that I'm worried about is the yields in the market. So what I do is I simply go to my enterprise risk system uh, or my treasury management system and I draw the data for the last one year. So I have one. So let's say this is T and let's say these are rates R1 and R2. So one, two, three, up till 252. And these are the closing zero coupon rates uh, for tenors one year and two. So, so R1 is basically the rate for one year. R2 is the rate for two years. And all these are historical rates that is standing today. So let's say we are standing on 19th of November, 21. So standing today, I look back one year, right up till 19th November, 2020, and I fetch all the relevant data. So now there is a reason why 252 is there uh, because uh, when we say 250, so can can someone guess uh, why I have written 252 and why not something else? Now it could have been 300 as well. Sundays and holidays. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Yes. So this is the number of business days in a year. So after adjusting for weekends and holidays, this is the number which we are left with. So whenever you see the number 252 the next time, uh, you can imagine that it's a yearly data or it's a one-year data. Now, this is something which I've simply drawn from my database. So, so let me just highlight this in yellow because we know that uh, in Excel or Excel conventions, anything which we highlight in yellow is like the input. So this is a plain input. Up till now, I have not done any calculation. I have simply queried my database and I have fetched these risk factors, which are already saved in my database. Along with this, I'm going to also fetch my today's end of the day value. So let's say today's end of the day has happened and uh, my closing yields or closing zero coupon yields are available to me. So I will write a EOD here. And let's say I call this as X, one and x2 so x1 is nothing but my oh, one year closing rate and x2 is nothing but a two year closing rate standing today so again no calculation i simply go to my market data provider and i fetch the numbers so that way i have the eod values as well. so now i have total of 253 data points one to 252 that is my historical data and the eod value which is as of today so this is simple fetching of uh, data as a next step. Sorry, I just switch colors. Now, as a next step, I need to calculate the percentage change in risk factors, or uh, I can also call them as the percentage return on my risk factors. So, I calculate a percentage change in RFs. So, let's call this as table B. Now I want to calculate a percentage change. So if I could give, uh, let's say some demo here, I have A, B and C. So imagine these are some values. So when I calculate a percentage change, it will look something like this. So I have a tenor and I have R1 and R2. So these are my number of days. So for the first data point, what I do is I simply take a percentage difference. So it will be like a B minus A upon A. Similarly, for data point two, I have to compare B and C. So it is nothing but C minus B upon B and so on. So imagine this entire table is filled. So for now, do not use end of the day. So focus only on uh, the first two, five, two points. Uh, we'll be using end of the day data later. So can someone quickly tell me how many data points will I have? So I have one, two. So should I have 253 data points, 252 or something else? So what should be my terminal value? Forty. Anyone? Anyway. Two fifty one. Two fifty. Absolutely. Two fifty one. Perfect. Thank you, sir. So it will be two fifty one because I am calculating a day over day return, isn't it? And if I have two fifty two points, then I'll have only two fifty one returns because for the very first day there is no reference. So on day number one, this a. This A value cannot be compared against anything in history. So for that, there will be no returns. So that's why I'll have one unit less. So since I have 252 points, I'll have just 251 returns, uh, which I'll finally be 
uh, using my calculation. So here I calculate simple percentage change in risk factor. So I do the same thing for R2 as well. So imagine R2 has something like maybe uh, I, J, and K. So if I try to just write it here, this can be written as something like J minus I upon I. So then it can be something like a K minus J upon J and so on. So imagine this 251 data points are entirely filled. So a simple calculation, I just write it once and I can just drag the formula for the entire table. So this is my table B. So allow me to just uh, erase the thing on the right hand side because I'm going to require that uh, white portion as well. So now let's come to table C. So table C is the place whereby I'm going to simulate risk factors. So I'll explain you the meaning of simulation of risk factors. So this is simulated RFs or simulated risk factors. So we'll understand the meaning of that. So we have a T, again, R1 and R2. So we'll have 1, 2 to 251. And imagine that this uh, calculation is available to me. So I have to do just the next step. So now this is the place or table C is the place whereby I'll relate these calculations. That is the percentage changes which I've done. Uh, that is B minus A by A and so on. Now all these percentage numbers I'll be relating with the end of the day values as of today. Because up till now we have not touched end of the day values. And why we need to do that now? Because we are calculating value at risk standing today. So that's why we should be able to relate it to the scenario standing today. And the idea of historical simulation war is, it's based on the premise that something which has happened in history can repeat. So something which has happened in near history can repeat. So that's why we are using historical data. But we need to relate that historical data with what is the current market scenario. So that's why we need to relate it with X1 and X2, respectively. So that way, I can do a simple... Uh, relation. So I can do a, I have to do a scaling. So this is what you call a scaling of risk factors or creation of simulated risk factors. So I have a X1 and I'll be just scaling it by this first bracket. I'm, I'm not writing it here for just to save space, but imagine that this percentage return calculation is available here. Similarly, I take X1 and I'll be scaling with, with the second value here and so on. Likewise, I have to do it for R2 as well. So just as I have X1 for my R1 column, I need to use X2 for R2. Now, why I need to do that? Because R2 is my two-year rate and X2 is also the closing two-year rate as of today. So X2 into the respective change in risk factors. So I do it for every single point for all of 251. And this is what you call a simulated risk factors. So although these are risk factors, but they are simulated using today's values. So that's why the name simulated risk factors. And now I'll introduce one more term, which you call as scenarios. So honestly, scenarios is nothing but uh, the way to address these values of 1 through to 251. So you can say what this is scenario number one. This is scenario number two and so on up till scenario number 251. So when we talk of value at risk calculation, these time points are also what you call as various scenarios. So just a separate nomenclature. And if you're comfortable calling them as time points, that's absolutely fine. That will not have impact on any downstream calculations. Next, let's come to table C, table D. So I have my simulated risk factors for every single scenario. Now, using this, I need to calculate what is the simulated MTM or simulated mark to market. So I'll, I'll explain it for one scenario and then you can just, and then other thing will be just a repetition of the same logic. So I just write the step first. So this is simulated MTMs. And I have a T, one, two, up to 251. And now I'm going to have a simulated MTM. So how do I calculate simulated MTM? Again, it's a simple bond pricing which I have to do repeatedly. So imagine that we are looking only at scenario number one. Ignore everything else. Just focus on the first blue bracket. Imagine these numbers are filled. So I'll just, uh, so can I just rename this X1 into bracket and X2 into bracket with something else so that I can use it in my calculation. So allow me to just erase this. So imagine that that is the result of the calculation. And let me just call them as probably Z1 and Z2. 
So let's say this comes out to be Z1 and this comes out to be Z2. Now, I want to price my bond. So all of us know that a bond pricing is nothing but present value in my future cash flows. Now, I have a bond which has two years to maturity and it's an annual coupon being bought. That is, I have a coupon which will be paid at the end of one year and a second coupon which will be paid at the end of two years along with the face value of my investment. So these are the two cash flows or the two time points which I need to be worried about. So if I had to write a simple bond pricing equation, I can write it this way. So let's say P1 is my scenario one bond price. This will be nothing but, uh, let's say my coupon is C, C units. So it will be C into E raised to minus Z1 into one plus C plus face value of my bond into E raised to minus Z sorry, minus Z2 into 2. So I've just used continuous discounting. So many a times in many textbooks, you may, you, may, uh, you may come across discrete discounting. Now, discrete discounting would look something like this. So it would be something like 1 up C upon 1 plus Z raised to, to the time. So these are equivalent. So this is discrete discounting. What I've done here is continuous discounting. So uh, finally, your answer is going to be very, very, very small. I mean, that variation will not be too much. Possibly the variation between continuous and discrete discounting will be observed in maybe the third or fourth decimal. So that is the change we should be seeing. So we can stick to continuous discounting. So simple bond pricing. I have my cash flow one, which is my first coupon, which is just discounted. And then I have my cash flow two which is my coupon plus face value into the discount factor. If I just add them together, I have my bond price, P1. <clears throat> so I just write this as P1. Now, I just move this blue block below. So let's I'll just use a purple block now to avoid confusion. Now I'll be focusing on the purple block. That is, I want to uh, calculate what is the bond price in scenario two. I use a similar logic. I Instead of P1, I have a P2 now. And I solve this equation again. Now, instead of Z1, Z2, I could have maybe something like a Z3 and a Z4. And I use it in the calculation. So just repeating my earlier calculation. And I have a P2 here. And so on, up till P2. So that way, I have my simulated MTMs, as I call it. These are available for my consumption. So let me just erase this section so that I get the remaining white portion of the screen to complete our entire flow. Now, once I have my simulated MTMs, my next step is to calculate the simulated profit and loss or simulated PNL as we call it. So let's label this as table D. Now, let's come to the next table. Let's say this is table E. Now, here I'm going to calculate my simulated PNL. So for simulated PNL, and it is nothing but my individual scenario prices minus what is the bond price as of today. So now I just uh, go back to my input sheet and I look at my end of the day values. So I have my EOD numbers available. So I have X1 and X2, which are nothing but the, the rates as of that, as of today. So I simply plug that into my bond pricing calculator. So I repeat the exact same calculation, which I had done for calculating P1. Only thing is here I'm using the ready rates, X1 and X2, X1 and X2 which is available to me. And using this, let's say I get a bond price and I call it as P, capital P. So let's say capital P is the bond price as of today. <clears throat> now, when I calculate simulated p &L, I need to take difference between today's price and each of these scenario-wise prices. So if I try this again, I have these individual scenarios, one, two, through to 251. So just two more steps to go and we have the VAR uh, with us. We have simulated PNL, which is nothing but a simple dif difference. That is, we have a P minus P1, P minus P2, and so on up till P minus P251. So this is what you call as a simulated PNL or a simulated profit and loss. Now, just uh, one more step. Uh, so here... I can't use these table directly. I need to do one more step before I go, before I go there, uh, which I call as sorting. Now, why sorting? Because if you recollect, when I had explained the concept of risk, I had related that with the distribution. And uh, when I mentioned, when I talk of risk, I should be worried about the left tail of my distribution. So if I'm worried about the left tail of the distribution, I should be worried about the potential losses which I'm exposed to. 
Now, when I calculate these simulated PNS, they can be in a haphazard manner. So let's say P minus P1 can be a positive number, P minus P2 can be negative, P minus P3 can again be positive. So that way, I cannot directly use them. I need to sort them and I'll sort them in an ascending order. So I'll have the lowest values, that is the most negative values first, and then I'll go on to the positive values. As I mentioned, positive values is not of concern to me. I am, in fact, happy if I have positive values. But negative values are something which are of concern to me. So that is where I'm going to use, or uh, 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 that will help me understand the VAR. So I run this through a sorting engine. So there are a few popular sorting techniques. So one is a bubble sort. So if you recollect in high school, when we had computer science as a part of our vocational or I mean elective as they call it, uh, we were asked to write these sorting algorithms. So at that time, you may recollect that you might have done bubble sorting. So that way we could arrange the numbers in ascending or descending order. So imagine that bubble sort is available and we are sorting this in a ascending order with the lowest values first, so that way I have a T and I have the simulated PNL. Only thing is this is sorted now. So imagine all of these are sorted values, P minus P1, P minus P2 and so on. Now, now just one last step to go. So this, let's call this sorted table as table F. Now, when I talk of VAR and let's say I'm looking at 99% value at risk. So I need to look at that percentile point on the distribution. So if I have 251 points, and if I, if I need to uh, access the, the one percentile value, then which should be the value which I look at? So now it's a simple lookup. So I have one, two, right up till 251. So which is this value in the table which I should address? Would anyone like to guess? So which value I pick up and I report it as one? Well? So what would be the one percentile value for 251 data points? Anyone? Which okay. is the highest negative? Uh, okay. Uh, so actually, it will be 2.5. So two, uh, to be precise, it will be 2.51 uh, value, which will be the 1 percentile value. 2.58, sir. Uh, sorry? 2.5 is standard deviation. That way, yes. you can uh, Yes, yes. So, so it will be 2.5 or 2.51. Now, naturally, 2.51th observation doesn't exist because we have integers. So there are two, three ways in which you can report VAR. So you can either report VAR as second worst observation, or you may report VAR as the third worst observation, or you may report VAR as the average of the second and third. So that way, regulator doesn't specify the way in which you can report VAR. You can use any of these three approaches. And I simply use one of the approach and I pick up the number and I report it as value at risk or VAR for this particular uh, position. Now, only thing is uh, there should be a consistency in the way in which you report. That is, uh, let's say we are in a January quarter. So imagine today is 1st of January and we are going to calculate the uh, value at risk for the next three months. So we are getting ready for the March quarter. So it should not happen that in January, I'm using second worst observation as VAR. Then in February, I decide to switch to third worst observation. Then in March, I again switch and go to the average. So this kind of fluctuation should not happen during this period of time because that uh, it can raise questions. So your internal auditors, your uh, concurrent auditors, even the regulators can come up with questions as to why you are changing the approach. So they may have doubts in mind whether you're trying to conceal any kind of losses on your book. So naturally, we don't want to end up in that position, isn't it? So always ensure that whichever approach you decide, follow it consistently. Because if you change the approach, you need to have a proper justification for that. Because your auditors are surely going to ask you for that. So the moment you switch, make sure the justification is ready. Because that question will definitely come at the end of the quarter. So as far as possible, don't change it during the quarter. If you have to, do it at the next quarter. So that is something which banks generally prefer doing. So now we spoke of the we spoke of the approach for a, a fixed income or a plain government security. Now this is the exact same approach which you can apply for other products as well. So tomorrow, if I have to do it for an interest rate swap, I can do it. Only thing is my risk factors change. So I'll have more number of risk factors. So let's say it's a USD LIBOR swap. Uh, LIBOR is going to vanish uh, in some time, but imagine that we have that swap on our book right now. So uh, I'll be sourcing the USD LIBOR curve. I'll do the exact same steps and 
uh, another thing which will change is the pricing bit. So here I had used a simple bond pricing. So there I'm going to use a swap price. So imagine I have access to a swap pricer with me. So only that will change. So basically my risk factors which I'm sourcing and my pricing engine, only that changes. Otherwise the approach more or less will be the same for any product which you look at. And this is what we call as a historical simulation bar. So if you allow me to go back to the presentation, this is exactly what I've shown on screen as well. So why I thought we should spend some time uh, through the example, because these are just placeholders as to the steps which I demonstrated. So if we quickly recap, firstly, it's RF identification. So we identified our risk factors, which were uh, uh, yields on government securities. Then we collected the risk factors. So uh, we simply queried our database and the enterprise risk system gave the risk factor data along with today's end of the day values. Then I calculate percentage change in the risk factors, also which we call as risk factor skip simulation. So I basically fill up two steps here. I have calculated percentage returns as well as I've done the scaling here. So I have the RF simulation which happens here. Next, I calculate simulated MTMs. So that is the sim MTM column which I have shown on table D in our calculation. Next is simulated PNL. That is simply a difference between my individual uh, scenario prices minus today's price and so on. And then after I have simulated PNL, I have to simply sort them in a proper order and I just need to look up a value and report it as well. So this is exactly the process which I have shown on the whiteboard as well. Only thing is I thought an example would be better because that gives clarity as to what exactly we are discussing. So of course, any questions which you have, request I request you to just park them. I just have one more slide to go and then we can take questions. Now, understanding a bit of relevance of technologies to risk analytics. So when we talk of technologies, there are a few things which you should be always um, uh, uh, looking at. So firstly, it's the kind of treasury management systems which we are using. So generally, we have Calypso or Burex as popular tools uh, which are used by organizations uh, when, it comes to, uh, when it comes to overall enterprise risk management. Now, uh, these are important tools because whenever we talk of any bank or a financial institution, it's a very large organization. So naturally, you require uh, one mother system which is going to hold all of your data. So that is what you call as a treasury management system. So uh, many a times, you'll have war models which will be configured as a part of Calypso or Murex systems. Next option can be you can have VAR implemented through these analytic softwares which you can purchase from third-party providers like SaaS, FinCAD, etc. Of course, now you have to pay them a certain license fee and then purchase it. Then there are open source tools, so something which are gaining a lot of traction. So the biggest advantage of open source tools is they are free and you don't have to pay anything to use Python or R and they are immensely powerful. So that way you can easily leverage these tools for building a value at risk uh, system as well. So even when I... Uh, work with work for my client projects or even on my training courses i extensively use python because that is something which uh, which is very very relevant to the financial industry and it makes things very very convenient and streamlined then of course uh, some knowledge of databases comes handy uh, this is because now i'd I'll, I'll like to relate a databases point with advanced analytics now advanced analytics so many a times you must have heard the word big data so big data is like a buzzword. So everyone wants to become a data scientist these days. So the trend has changed. 10 years back, every, every postgraduate uh, coming from an MBA institute wanted to become an IA banker. Now everyone wants to become a data scientist. Uh, things keep changing. But when you talk of big data, uh, you can imagine it's a large volume of data. And uh, can, you can imagine that to be like a data which is coming at a very, very fast rate. Uh, so imagine that uh, prices from Nifty. So you're getting nifty prices uh, minute by a few every few seconds. So that way you can imagine the quantum of data which uh, fills in. So uh, when you have such kind of big data techniques being used, it's always good to have some knowledge of database. So I'm not saying you become a database administrator, but having some knowledge from a, is helpful even from a risk management perspective. Because every time you cannot have Excel to hold the data, especially for big data applications, you cannot use Excel because all of us know the shortfalls of Excel as well. So the moment, let's say I have about 50,000 rows of Excel, then you can imagine the kind of uh, lag which will be there on Excel, which is simply not acceptable from uh, analytics applications. So that's why having knowledge of databases comes handy for risk analytics as well. 
and uh, one one small bit on advanced analytics so these are the techniques which are being used by risk analysts globally in order to enhance the overall risk management process so one idea which uh, which i'd like to explain uh, i mean we'll not get into too much of details but something which we call it as a pca principle or something which we call as a principal component analysis so this comes from linear algebra so again, uh, uh, because the thing is, you'll observe that in finance, we borrow many things from other branches. So linear algebra is another branch of uh, mathematics from which we uh, borrow this particular concept. And PCA basically helps in what we call as, there's a related concept called as dimensionality reduction. So again, in the interest of time, we'll not get into too much of dimensionality reduction bit because this is a separate topic altogether. But these are like the advancements which happen. Now, these are things which you can later on check out. So there are a lot of things which are available on PCA. And I had written one, uh, so I think last year in one of my articles, I had written applications of PCA to risk analytics. So maybe you can go through my website. So there's a block section. So my website is right here. So there is a block section on my website where I write, uh, publish all my blogs. So there you'll see an application of PCA to risk management. So that is just one technique, but that way, and risk analysts globally are coming up with more and more innovative techniques, uh, which are being consumed by, uh, by the industry. And finally, coming to the regulatory environment. Now, this is equally important because finally, the job of the regulator is also very, very uh, crucial because the idea is to maintain, uh, ensure that the decorum is maintained in the overall uh, market and the industry. So again, uh, value at risk plays a very important role from your regulatory reporting perspective. So firstly, it's an accepted metric for portfolio risk. So uh, it can either be for your MIS or even for your RBI reports. So in India, RBI, globally, you'll have other regulators. Then it's also a part of RBS data part. So, uh, so, any, so auditors as a part of our group, uh, those of you who audit banks, have you heard of the term RBS before? So any banking entities which you may be auditing, and this is the term which you might come across at the end of every quarter before you give them a sign-off. Okay, so RBS stands for risk-based supervision. Again, now this is a requirement from the RBI. So many times even the regulator can ask that whether you are prepared for that RBS reporting because RBI gives a certain deadline for RBS reporting. So if I recollect, it's around 22 days after after the quarter completion. So let's say if it's a September quarter, so if, uh, if 30th of September the quarter ends, then the banks are expected to submit RBS data points to the RBI by latest 22nd of October. So uh, RBS data, again, this includes, so VAR is one of the points which goes on with the RBS data as well. So again, that's why it's a very, very important metric there as well. And regulator treats RBS data very, very, uh, and it's a very crucial data point, and they observe it very, very closely. So any mistakes on RBS data are simply unacceptable. So that way, if, uh, if the regulator spots any uh, errors in RBS reports, then it, it can immediately start a regulatory or a disciplinary action against that respective bank. So banks are extremely careful when it comes to RBS data reporting, and VAR happens to be one of the points of RBS data. And also the advantage is whenever all the banks are reporting for one single metric as a part of risk, it becomes easy from regulatory perspective as well. Because imagine that there are 10 banks which uh, a certain regulator is uh, monitoring. And let's say these 10 banks are using 10 different approaches for measurement of risk. That will become difficult to uh, keep track of those things, isn't it? So generally even from a regulatory perspective, the regulator will push for a certain approach and historical simulation happens to be one of that approaches which uh, regulators and market participants like. So that's why that is like a preferred approach. And this brings a kind of uniformity in the way, way in which banks submit their risk plans. So that way we have covered the different gamuts of uh, valuatives. So we understood the concept. So we just take a step back. We are, firstly, we understood the concept. Then we did a quick overview of various approaches. Next, we understood the model in detail. So we, now we know step-by-step step exactly how value at risk gets uh, calculated as well. Next is uh, various technologies, the relevant techniques which are required by risk analysts and also the advancements in techniques which are being used in the industry. And finally, the regulatory environment. 
So, so these are a few things uh, which I wanted to cover as a part of my uh, discussion. So uh, any questions which anyone has, I'll be happy to take them now. Yes, participant can unmute and ask the question from Amyaji. Do you have any? Uh, excuse me, sir. Yes, yeah. ma'am. Uh, sir, can we move the, to the whiteboard where we have done some calculations? Yes, yes, absolutely. So let me just switch. Yes, ma'am. Sir, here uh, we have calculated Z1 and Z2. But Correct. while... Uh, while calculating simulation, uh, this uh, we used only Z1. Uh, what will we do for what, why we have calculated Z2? Uh, because I have a bond with a two-year cash flow, isn't it? Because I have a two-year bond. So I will require a certain rate for the two-year tenor as well. So for that, I require a Z2 as well. Because without that, I cannot discount that cash flow. So, uh, for, uh, so that means uh, when we are calculating P1, we have used both Z1 and Z2. Z1 for uh, one year cash flow or the interest rate, interest we have received, and Z2 we have used for cash flow and interest we have received at the year. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. That is correct. Okay. Oh, thank you, sir. Some people in the chat as well. Sir, one question. <clears throat> yes, please. In the, in the case of wire trust, you know, even though it has some positive advantages, Extreme tail events are difficult, becomes difficult to predict. Like, for example, sudden failures, which have been happening off late. How yes. do we mo I mean, model that or what type of uh, tools are used for catching up? You have this PCMC and fraud related things coming up. I understand it's an operational risk. So right. how do we I mean, address them and how do we put a, you know, a stop, upper stop, uh, stop loss position or what example, uh, capital liquidity ratios testing can be done. Because you don't have an event uh, horizon which is available on the historical platform. So we have a big challenge on that. I was told that some people are using um, chaos theory and some other stuff, which is simpler we can possibly do. Can you just tell us on something? Correct. Yeah. That's a very relevant question. Yes. So when we talk of value at risk, yes. I and mean, if there are any significant events which are happening outside the window, we are completely missing it. So, for instance, I mean, if something had happened on day 253 in history, that is getting missed because we are using the moving window. So, even going ahead, as you rightly said, yes, there can be various challenges to which we get exposed to. So, again, there are these kind of black swan events which we call for which uh, valuators may not give us a satisfactory enough response. So, uh, so that way, what banks do is, in addition to valuators, they have other types of uh, risk control measures which they use. So, one is obviously the capital adequacy. So banks always try to have a certain capital adequacy number more than what the regulator expects. So even if there are defaults or market stresses, bank doesn't turn into problems. Uh, other thing which possibly we can uh, a bank can have is a better credit risk uh, management technique. That is before uh, advancing loans to any new borrowers, uh, and they may be having a more comprehensive credit check uh, before they advance any loans, such that, I mean, uh, the potential of default comes down. So possibly that can be uh, another metric which can be used. Now, again, these advanced analytics techniques are being extensively used for credit risk management. So compared to market risk, uh, I mean, credit risk is using them significantly, especially for things like maybe credit analysis of new borrowers. So if a new loan application comes in, more uh, many a times you have an automated process which is going to uh, do those standardized steps in order to give a certain yes and no answer before the credit officer is going to decide on whether a certain loan will be uh, uh, dispersed or not dispersed. So I feel along with war, other things which, uh, which should be uh, taken into consideration, especially from managing tail events perspective, one is capital adequacy. Then second is a very strong credit risk analysis, which uh, any bank does. Possibly even good amount of stress testing. Uh, so why stress testing? Because through stress testing, what banks try to do is they try to test that in any plausible scenarios which can happen in the future, whether they are positioned well enough and whether their models are robust enough to understand that kind of risk. So possibly these three uh, are the areas which I feel should be used along with VAR, which banks are already using, so that in terms of uh, these black swan events, they are still well prepared. But again, uh, when we talk of black swan event, it is very difficult to uh, that way understand when that event is going to occur. So it's only uh, uh, 
so only when the event actually happens then we'll basically see how exactly a bank is faring but uh, these are a few measures which a bank should a bank is taking in order to understand these kind of potential risks that is uh, i just go through the chat as well Cold book on risk management and calculating war. Ah, uh, yes. So uh, one good book is uh, John C. Hull. So J. C. Hull's book on I think it's titled Options, Futures, and Other Derivatives. So that's a good book on risk. Now again, uh, it's not plain risk management. It has derivatives plus risk. But uh, it, they have a chapter on value at risk and exactly how VAR is calculated as well. So uh, uh, John C. Hart is a good reference. Other than that, any other resource online as well. Then certain advanced books, and you have a Wilmot as well. So Wilmot's book on quant finance is also uh, a very good quality reading material. Uh, again, it will give some more pointers on VAR. These were the questions in chat. Yeah, so any more questions for anyone? One more question, sir. Yes, sir, please. Sir, I, I've been seeing that, you know, because of the inability to predict the daily events correctly, people are using something called the copulas, which are joint probability distributions and trying to take the distribution separately and okay. then combine it up. How does it really work and how do we put it in the uh, frame of uh, risk uh, metrics? Correct. I get a good question. Yes. So when we talk of copulas, we try and relate it from a credit risk management perspective. So through copulas, we try to understand uh, a, a probability of joint default. So uh, one example of joint default can be a contagion effect. So contagion effect basically implies that if uh, one entity defaults, then there is a very good chance that some other entity will default as well, because those entities also have trading relationships among each other. So through copula modeling, what we try to do is we try to understand what is the probability of such joint default events occurring, and then take required corrective action. So a corrective action can be uh, maybe uh, increasing the amount of collateral which you are collecting, or possibly uh, maybe uh, enhancing a bit on your capital charge perspective, or possibly maybe uh, reducing your overall uh, lending which you're doing to a certain party which may be, uh, which may have a higher chance of default. So maybe these two or three techniques could be used in response to these copula engines. So yes, I get, uh, copula is a, is a very, very interesting topic. And again, uh, from a credit risk analytics perspective, it's a, uh, it's a very important technique which gets used from especially the quantitative risk management perspective. Uh, uh, do actuaries use same analysis while working on risk in any call? Uh, yes, so the thing is, actuaries use uh, many more things, to be honest, because uh, when we talk of insurance risk, they take into consideration various types of risk. So again, depending on the kind of risk which, or depending on the kind of insurance product which you're looking at. So whether it's a, uh, whether it's a life product or a non-life product, uh, depending on that, again, the kind of risk which one is exposed to is different. So to answer uh, your question, yes, I mean, in addition to war, they have other techniques and other analysis which they use and actually use a heavy amount of statistics and mathematical concepts uh, in their overall uh, overall jobs, I would say, as compared to a simple uh, war. Okay, so there was one question which I missed, sorry. Uh, uh, which, so the question was uh, whether market risk is fatal or credit risk. So the thing is, uh, both of the risks are equally important. But if you ask me quantum wise, uh, credit risk is something which is significant from a bank's perspective. So that I can relate from a capital charge perspective. So if you take any, any bank, so let's say some Indian bank, maybe a mid-sized bank, Let's say my uh, overall uh, capital charge is 100 crores. Imagine a very, very nominal number. It's never that low. But imagine it is 100 crores for ease of our calculation. Then out of 100 crores, maybe close to uh, 75 to 80, or uh, possibly even, I think around 70 crores would come from credit risk. 
maybe some more bit from probably credit and ops would occupy most of the things and market risk would be a very small quantum of that so that way from a bank's perspective credit risk becomes uh maybe a slightly more important risk which they are exposed to but that being said a market risk is a measure which is frequently used from the overall risk management so that cannot be ignored because uh, whenever a bank is holding any kind of investments as a part of their book be it a investment or be it a trading position they need to understand what are the fluctuations which are impacting their position because even that can lead to a potential credit loss so although we study market and credit risk separately in isolation uh, there are there are many intersections between these two uh, sections of risk so i would say from a bank's risk i mean although the quantum of overall credit risk which the bank is managing is higher but these two risks are something which will have to be equally uh, uh, seen by the bank for the overall well being and ensuring that the bank continues as a point concern thank you sir thank you very much question i mean right. now no more question so we will have formal vote of thank and k sarup ji our member will give formal vote of thank for us okay it's always pleasure to give a vote of thanks sir. thanks for the opportunity apv and sudeep uh, sandeep agarwal sir our pdc sir. it's a beautiful and auspicious day in most of our uh, parts of our country we are celebrating what is called deepam festival on such a kind of day we had a fully loaded session from this session i personally got two things one clarity two confusion clarity on what risk is and uh, how to look at the risk uh, till now i thought innovation uh, has a lot of risk proposition but from this today's session i came to understand there are very much innovative skills or softwares that uh, sees risk all together uh, differently uh, from our perspective and uh, other perspective and i also got clarity what kind of technologies and uh, uh, material that i have to go through to understand uh, what is value at risk coming to the confusion we uh, till uh, start of this session uh, were thinking that mar uh, mark to market way of valuation or accounting was most transparent but thanks to our chief guest Uh, he opened our uh, uh, way of looking uh, at it and uh, i understood that it needs further deliberations and discussions i am sure most of the participants would have experienced the same it's my pleasure to thank uh, our chief guest uh, chiraga chakrabarty sir and speaker amaya abhyankar sir for participation in the uh, seminar and imparting their knowledge and experience to all our members i thank each and every participant uh, for your enthusiasm to learn and your active participation i thank apv sandeep agarwal sir head of pdc and president bhave sir for such a wonderful session it's varup signing off the session on behalf of apv see you in the next webinar next friday thank you thank you so much thank you everyone thank you sir have a good evening wonderful session yeah. thank you sandeep ji right thank you very much yeah bye bye and good night to you bye sir good night thank you ma'am